Hey folks, thanks for joining us. We're gonna jump into an intro in a little bit while we wait for some people to jump online, but don't be shy, jump in the chat and we're gonna be looking for your comments. But I wanted to start it off, we were chatting <laughs> earlier, Jim. Um, we, we talked about like the NASA and Silicon Valley podcast. Yeah. Jim has his own podcast, so there's a plug <laughs> yeah, for that, uh, called Gravity Assist. Right. And the thing that I get a kick out of it is you, at the end of the show, you always talk to the people of like, what was your gravity assist to landing at NASA or working on space? So yeah, I guess, so I'm going to pivot the question to you. All right. What was your <laughs> gravity assist? How did you end up at NASA? Well, you know, I was always good in math and science, um, uh, and uh, I actually was watched all the Star Treks from the very beginning. You know, this is with William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy, nice. and and really enjoyed that, but. I ended up working in an observatory. I ended up having a 12-inch Alvin Clark refractor at my beck and call. I was able to build the instruments on the back end of it. Now I started doing a lot of astrophotography and then developing my own film. Nice. You know, and 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 you know, uh, uh, the high school chemistry teacher was just you know opened the doors. I had I had the keys to the school. Okay. <laughs> You know, I was trusted. Here's the nice. keys to the school. Go down and observe whatever you wanted to, you know, yeah. et cetera. And then, uh, you know, some of the stuff I actually got published in Sky and Telescope. Uh, so when I left uh, uh, high school I got, uh, as a senior, and uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was going to be an optical astronomer. Okay. And then I, and then I went to the University of Iowa. Um, and took astronomy. Shout one out one. to Ames, Iowa. Not the same location, but <laughs> we constantly get confused. Yeah, <laughs> Iowa's got some really great schools, but I'm talking about the Hawkeyes, nice. not the Cyclones. <laughs> uh, but um, so uh, I had uh, astronomy 101 from James Van Allen, okay. and the place was packed. You know, like four or five hundred people crammed in there. And um, uh, at the end of that, I got an A. You know, and there was a certain number of people got an A. And then second semester. Uh, he didn't teach it, but uh, he went on to other things. And, and I, I picked another course called uh, Readings in Astronomy. And uh, it was taught by staff. Okay. Room 701, Van Allen Hall, show up. So I walk in there, and it's a storeroom. You know, there's <laughs> tapes everywhere and bookcases and printout. And I'm look, go, going through the course catalog, catalog. Am I in the right room at the mm -hmm. right time for Readings in Astronomy? And Van Allen leans behind the bookcase and says, no, Jim, you're in the right place, and you're my only student. <laughs> and that was my second gravity assist. And what I did was I used the observations I did uh, with, the, with the Alvin Clark refractor. I took a picture of the sun uh, every day for like six months, and I did sunspot rotation. I made, made measurements of the sunspots. I, uh, okay. I, I wrote a, a scientific paper. He was the reviewer. And I understood at the end of that what research was all about, and I was hooked. And so at that time, I was, uh, was like on their 54th experiment on their satellite. And so for me, doing astronomy, I could do it from spacecraft. And, and it was just a normal evolution to just get involved in that. Well, well and Jim, um, also the Van Allen that you mentioned is uh, <laughs> a lot of people probably don't know who uh, who he is and what's named after him too. So, uh. well, there, yeah, he is our really first true space scientist. Uh, he developed a, uh, an instrument that went on Explorer One, um, and that was launched on the 31st of January. Uh, 60 years ago you know we're oh, coming wow. up to the 60th anniversary so uh, uh, 1958 and you know spacecraft goes up and, and enters the these high radiation environments and they figure out what it is and and by May of that year uh, he announces the discovery of the Van Allen radiation belts oh wow yeah. Heard of those. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'll pivot Kinda on. Cool. Uh, I know. Well, I'll pivot over. Very not cool. <laughs> yes. If you're just joining us, um, you're watching or listening to the. It's either the 76th episode of the NASA and Silicon Valley podcast or our first ever episode of NASA and Silicon Valley Live. Um, so, for folks, if you didn't know, this is a conversational podcast uh, to meet with the various researchers, scientists, engineers, and overall cool people throughout NASA and here at NASA's Ames Research Center, 
in Silicon Valley. So if you're a fan of the audio podcast, obviously we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we're doing it for the first time live on video and on Twitch TV. Um, but first and foremost, a shout out to the live audience uh, who is watching us and on the chat. I see a lot of shout outs coming through. Um, we're going to start things off by chatting with folks. Uh, we're going to talk about the moon. We have some cool things to show you guys of like actually at least virtually online visiting different locations on the moon. Um, I'm your host, Matthew Buffington, and if you notice me looking at my laptop, it's because I'm looking at the chat room as much as possible. And so when I'm looking over here trying to find questions, uh, my co-host, Abby Tabor, is going to be yes. moving things along. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so maybe right now I could introduce our guests to the audience. So we have here, all the way from NASA headquarters, Dr. Jim Green, mm -hmm. who's the director for Planetary Sciences. And also, more locally here at Ames, we have Dr. Greg Schmidt, who's the de Deputy Director of NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. A mouthful. Is that it? Yes, you got Survey. it. Survey. <laughs> Survey. I'll call that And there's a good lunar backstory to just that name and to the institute there is, all together. There is, but yeah. before we get into the good stuff and, we're ta and we start talking about the moon, um, a little bit of housekeeping for the old audio and the new Twitch audience. Uh, this is basically a new format we're trying out. We've never done this before. We're figuring this out as we go. Um, we're going to continue to do this for the next couple weeks um, on twitch.tv slash NASA, basically doing this podcast, but on Twitch and taking your taking the and going through the chats. Um, but, you know, basically the plan is for us to keep talking to some experts, take questions from everybody. If you can't catch us live, that's no big deal. You can find us on youtube.com slash NASA Ames and also on RSS podcast services throughout the solar system and beyond. And I think our plan is we'll have those up by Tuesday. But so we talked about Jim's gravity right. assist. Greg, tell us about how you joined NASA, how you ended up in Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah, well, the story starts a really long time ago. So, uh, um, and, and I'll, I'll do a quick fast forward because when I was already at, at NASA, um, I was over at my mom's house one day and she, she says, Greg, I want to show you something. She shows me this little thing drawn by a six-year-old who turned out to be uh, me a really long time ago. And it was a drawing of, of a few spaceships. And, uh, and it said, when I grow up, I want to work for NASA. And, uh, nice. This was, this was during the Gemini program. <laughs> and I remember the Mercury program, too, although I was really, really young mm -hmm. then. So I kind of, I, I, I guess it was probably in the uh, 31st chromosome somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in here, you know, kind of destined to be. My, my dad um, also was here. My parents met here at NASA oh. Ames Research Center. Nice. My wife and I met here at NASA <laughs> Ames Research Center. It's kind of the family business. I said, yeah. you right here? <laughs> we didn't. No. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, well. We There's a big wind have. tunnel. You could have. <laughs> yeah, that would have made a nice setting. Yeah. <laughs> would have had to convince my wife, I think. <laughs> so uh, my dad was the, was the guy that proved that it was possible to navigate to the uh, moon during the Apollo era. This was right around really? 1960. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And uh, and so uh, fast forward a little bit to my teen years, um, you know, like, like Jim, I was good in uh, um, science and math and whatnot. Um, I built my own observatory. We have a family ranch about an hour and a half from here, and, and I built an observatory, ground my own uh, mirror no and, and wow. everything, and used that for, uh, for a few years. And so, uh, and then uh, when I was uh, out of graduate school, I just was talking with someone and who happened to work here, and, mm -hmm. and she said, oh, you need to come by and meet some people. And mm -hmm. that was uh, 33 and a half years ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> but it starts by looking up. It starts yeah. by looking yeah. up. Being true. fascinated by what you see. Yeah, yeah, that's a message that I think we can share with everyone out there. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't have to, be, have to work at NASA, of course, to be interested in this stuff. There's a lot of people yeah. interested. And there's so much cool stuff to see yeah. up there. What's really unfortunate, you know, over time is many of our big cities, it's hard to mm -hmm. see Very beyond true. a few stars and maybe it a is. couple planets. Yeah. But, um, Getting out and, and, and finding an opportunity to just go out where there's no lights and lay in a field and look up and yeah. look at the the Milky Way. Uh -huh. and, and I mean, it, yeah. it looks like the sky is on fire. Yeah. And recognize yeah. that, you know, 
the history of humankind went through the era where the sky played a dominant role in their thinking and their culture. You know, the identification That's of the right. planets uh, had been known at least uh, you know the uh, a six out of the out of the eight or nine depending yeah. on y w your persuasion <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know uh, and uh, that's such a fascinating part of uh, of our life here on earth the, the sky is included yeah and now we have an opportunity to go out and visit those objects that we see you know like the moon it's so cool and the and the very word planet comes from the greek planetus which means wanderers that's right and so and these were stars that didn't behave like the rest of the stars they, you know they they actually moved with respect to the background mm -hmm. and uh, the ancients didn't know why that was. And it wasn't until relatively modern times, just a few hundred years ago, that people finally figured that out. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and not until our generations here that we actually have been able to send probes to them through, uh, through Jim's program at NASA headquarters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in time, you know, there's been just a number of revolutions in the way we think. And Copernicus, as an example, was the one that uh, really proposed that all these planets moved around uh, the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, Tycho Brahe uh, observing mm -hmm. uh, the planets in, in, in really precise ways, and giving that data to a mathematician, Johann Kepler. Yes, and totally. Kepler then really figured out you know, what was happening. In fact, he did it with Mars, and he was mm -hmm. able to do it because Mars' orbit is, is, um, uh, has a nice little eccentricity about it. And, he, and it was hard to fit that. And that forced him into a mathematical construct called an ellipse. And then things just, once, it was, once that data was ordered in that way, things just fell right into place and created the laws, Kepler's laws, wow. and we use those today. Yeah. And we're starting that next set of revolution, and that is using those equations, building on the past, getting out into the solar system, by those equations. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, give, yeah. giving a, a slight shout out over to, to the Twitch chat, there was, um, let me look at this, Droptimus Prime said, no, don't look at the Twitch chat for the love of God. <laughs> and then another person, was it Snid Ramon? It says, good luck going through the chat to find real questions. So ha. we're going to try our best. <laughs> don't be shy with the feedback. We're trying to figure out how, how this whole thing yeah. works. But and, it doesn't matter. Doing a we'll thing. give real answers. Exactly. We so we but let's yeah. pivot on over to the moon. We called this, we're going back to the moon. Right, right. In a lot of ways, we've never really left. Correct. But it is about putting astronauts on the moon. But you guys have just wrapped the lunar science and landing sites workshop. Right. Yeah. So why don't you guys yeah. talk a little bit about what was that workshop? What did you guys do? And it, like, it just wrapped up like two hours ago. Yeah, I did. So tell us a little bit about a, that. It was just a really, I think, a seminal event in terms of what will happen next hmm. in, in the exploration of the moon. Uh, you know, as you point out, Matt, you know, we've been to the moon uh, the whole space era. Right now, for instance, we have an orbiting satellite. It's called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Mm -hmm. It's a fabulous, fabulous spacecraft, and it's very healthy with all kinds of spectacular instruments. In fact, it's got one instrument on it. Uh, that um, is a high resolution imager. If this table sat on the moon, it could see it. Oh, all right? Wow. And, and that, that really, in, it's an enabling capability because we then can use that to be able to study the moon in high resolution detail that allows us then to pick out places we want to go to do all kinds of different science and land safely. And that's what's really critical. In fact, um, uh, you know, LRO has been observing the moon for quite a while and, and has observed many of the Apollo sites. Mm -hmm. it's, um, mm -hmm. uh, I fa I, in fact, uh, you can get on the web and, you know, do lunar reconnaissance orbiter, sort on that, and look for uh, Apollo landing sites. And I think we've uh, we've got one that you can that we just pulled yeah. off the web that you can take a look at. It's uh, from uh, 
Apollo 17. 17, yeah. Yeah, the last uh -huh. time humans were on the moon. Do you con continue studying those <clears throat> same sites? Is that why you might we look do? At them today? And we do that through a variety of mechanisms. One way we do that is uh, is through the samples they brought back. Uh, yeah. They brought about mm -hmm. brought back about 850 pounds of huh. uh, of material, both no. rock nice. but also <laughs> loose soils, the regolith, oh, yeah. and uh, uh, maybe a little less than that, but on that order. <laughs> and um, uh, and and we are interrogating those, and we're learning all kinds of things about those, yeah. which is really fascinating. Another way we we actually still use those sites is they they also put out a series of retro reflectors. Yeah. Okay. And this enables us to fire a laser beam, hit that, and then have it come back, and all we do is time it. Oh. And since uh, a lot of early, early physics work was done in, ter in terms of determining the speed of light, we can easily then take that knowledge and figure out how far away the moon is. By the time we emit the light and receive the light, it travels at the speed of light, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and and we can calculate it. And of course, that's about two and a half seconds all the way up and back, and and we can calculate it to just a very small fraction of difference. And what we're finding out in those 40 years that that those laser re reflecting stations have been there is that the moon is moving away from us mm -hmm. oh, very, slowly, very slowly, very yeah. slowly. But yeah. it is doing that. It. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's on the yeah. order of a centimeter or so a year, a year and, huh. and so after 40 years, it's clearly yeah. measurable. And this is during the course of uh, the whole workshop. You guys are all just like hanging out, talking about this, or <laughs> I guess, uh, how did we're that talking even about? Come? Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say, Greg, how did it all come together? I mean, I know like you, you had a lot to do with like formulating it oh, together, yeah. pulling it. You yeah, know. absolutely. And and boy, I work with just the best team in, mm -hmm. in the world. I I think, and and one of them nice. being this gentleman back here. I don't know if we can get a camera on him or mm -hmm. not, but uh, yeah, Dave, Dave has our cloud cam. Well, shut up. <laughs> yeah, you see, right. Clive, yeah. Clive is waving. Clive. Neil uh, from Notre Dame University. Uh, he and I co-chaired this uh, this wonderful thing. We oh, had uh, we had people from all over the world. We had quite mm -hmm. a significant Japanese contingent. They're, they have a big interest in the in the moon. We had some uh, we had some Europeans. We had uh, had people from everywhere. Jack Schmidt, who was yes. uh, who, along with Gene Cernan, were, were the two pe last people to walk on the moon. Jack was uh, was here. He is uh, still in his. He's in his eighties. Remarkable and man. He is Un sharp. Unbelievable. Oh my gosh. Also, sharp former honest. senator, right? As former senator. Yes. Yep. 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 He was there when the latest uh, pivot to the moon was announced by the White House. One of the really significant things that's going on right now. Is uh, is lunar commerce? There's a brand yeah, new yeah. industry they haven't yet launched, but they've been uh, they've been working on this for a few years. Um, a number of the uh, companies, and uh, what they want to do is deliver stuff to the moon. Mm -hmm. They want to do that for NASA, of course, and for other space agencies. Yeah. But they want to start a whole industry up there. And that, to me, is incredibly exciting. And, and the way I see it is we are just on the edge of really having the moon be another planet for humanity. Mm. It's, nothing, it's nothing short of that. Yeah, that's going to be a tough place to live, right? There's, there's no air, and uh, um, we have found that there's water, though, exactly. on, on the permanently shadowed craters on the, uh, on the poles. Um, and, and elsewhere. And so uh, we think that there's the resources to build domes, build habitats mm -hmm. for ourselves and to, uh, to supply water that we, that we need to break it into oxygen that we can breathe and uh, break it into hydrogen and oxygen for fuel. And so uh, we think that we have all the resources that we need. We just need to go there. Well, here, I can jump in on the chat. There was a question from Mello Canuck. Right on. Um, it's like, would a base on the moon be surface or subterranean or a mix of both? Mm. Oh, Who's that's a that super out? good question. So, so um, I, I don't know if, you know, I, I could take it first well, if you or uh, whatever, you know. You know? Uh, 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 this is what, uh, not every place on the moon is created equal. That's right. We're finding, uh, because this was all about what are the important sites to go to, we were covering all sorts of fascinating mm -hmm. locations. Now, one type of formation on the moon we call it a pit, 
but in reality it's probably a collapse of either a chamber that was a, a, a bubble of air at one time that where the ceiling has collapsed after the the volcanic material cooled or actually a lava tube for okay. which the ceiling is collapsed and so uh, uh, that uh, is a fascinating uh, there's like 300 that we've that we've identified so far yeah. already not only in the front side uh, but also the, the the far side of the moon yeah and uh, what's really fascinating about these is um, indeed if if humans wanted to go into these uh, they would have a number of advantages it'd be mm -hmm. enormous amount of protection uh, uh, from the radiation environment that we know exists. Um, uh, and since the moon doesn't have a magnetosphere, a big magnetic field, although it has remnant magnetic field pieces on it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it doesn't have an atmosphere to stop the, uh, the, even the solar wind that hammers the moon, places like these would be really important yeah. to, to be able to have a station or a location. So uh, we're moving into a, into a realm where it's not no, just only surface to be considered. There are places that you could actually go and, yeah. and, and you know, come down, create an inflatable and be able to live and work in an area that, that is a natural protection for you. Yeah, and when you say that, like some of those tubes, they, they're always looking at Earth. Yeah, the because, lock, uh, because the moon is We, we might have been locked. talking about this yes, during yes, lunch, yes, so yeah, I remember. So the moon is tidally locked. Uh, actually, we have a, a view of one of these, which is really great if we could bring oh, awesome. it up. Yeah. All right, there we here go. We look go. at that. All right. So uh, that, you know, when you look at it, you may think it's a crater, but you have, if you really study it, you can determine it's so much different than what a crater really looks like. And so you have a sun angle, and, it, and that sun is shining on one part of it, and then uh, and so you see the shadow in there. Okay. And, uh, and then you see, you know, very sharp edges. Uh, and so, indeed, that's a fabulous, a fabulous pit, we call it. Uh, a, a skylight is another another uh, term that we use. I've heard that. Mm -hmm. But because the moon is tidally locked on on the near side, that means uh, that the, we don't we only see one face of it, right? Correct. Yeah. It? Tidally yeah. locked yes. means uh, you know uh, one day on the moon is one orbit also, and that is yeah. because um, uh, uh, when the moon was formed early on, it was actually formed very close to the Earth, and as we know, and we just talked about, it, it's continually moving away. But billions of years ago one orbit around the earth was maybe five or six hours long uh -huh. right now it's 28 days long yeah, and yeah. and and so uh that tidal locking it means that that one one uh, one side uh faces the moon and that's really really caused all kinds of different structures on the moon there's major differences between that near side than the front side uh, uh, but in this particular case with these skylights, there are some that, you know, you can get into and then constantly look up and see the Earth. Those would be prime locations hmm. for human exploration. I kind of want to know more about that, though. Why did the lava <laughs> tubes all well, go in so, one direction? What? Oh, why? Um, well, one of the things that I wanted to say, and then, and then we can okay. address that, uh, that <laughs> question. There, so, so it's... Um, it, the Earth is a really nice place to live. We have this really thick <laughs> atmosphere that mm -hmm. shields us from all sorts of harsh radiation from right. the uh, sun. There, there's uh, there's um, things called coronal mass ejections, where you have these giant explosions on the on the sun that send uh, streams of high energy particles our way. And the Earth protects us from that. Our magnetic mm -hmm. field protects us from that. Our atmosphere protects us from that. On the moon, you don't have that. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, Jim mentioned that there's small uh, magnetic field areas. We're, we took a look at those at this, uh, at this workshop. And so you have to do something else to protect you. you know? and, so, uh, and so this, um, putting, uh, putting a habitat. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> exactly. It's there, right? You don't need to get a moon bulldozer. <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, and That's right. That's right, and so and so that's something that we're uh, that we're looking at pretty seriously. But you know, it has some challenges. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, the, the simplified <laughs> getting there, living there maybe quite a bit if we don't have to construct habitats. Correct, but, but it has another challenge. <laughs> yeah, what's that? You know, some of these uh, some of these drops down to the surface might be a hundred meters. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and so now uh, you know, and we don't have a ramp. You know, we can't just drive down into it. We haven't found one yet that really. Uh, mm -hmm. There might be some hints of a couple that have that capa that feature associated mm -hmm. with them, but um, 
uh, so, so many of them are just the collapse of the roof. And so then you have to be able to get down to them. That's now, right. scientifically, these are incredibly exciting. And they are because you see the stratigraphy. You know, as you can go down the sides, you can see the layers uh, that we can't get into oh, from yeah. surface missions, you know. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and those layers are, you know, that's the geological book of the moon. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. how wow. old they are that's and what right. are they yeah. made of and, and, and how, uh, how have they evolved on an airless body, you know, over four billion years. And so, and then when you get down into the bottom part of that, we don't know what the cave structure or cavern structure or, or lava tube structure really looks like. We don't know how far it goes or where it goes, uh, but it's a different environment because it's been sheltered yeah. all this right. time. Yeah. We don't know what we're going to find in nice. there. Nice. <laughs> is, is, is that exciting? <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, yeah. folks, we have, we have Rocket oh. Gamma, one of the swivels. Oh, oh yes. wonderful. Yeah, so, let's take a look at that. So another, yeah, had, another site, another one of the sites that are really exciting um, that, that could be considered for human exploration are locations on the moon where the remnant magnetic field, that means the field, the, mag, the, the magnetosphere of the moon, which it must have had early on in its life, has gone away. You know, the core is now solid. It's probably not liquid. It's not circulating to generate a, a magnetic field. And so the rocks that, that were molten at the time, as they solidify, they take that field. They take ownership of that field. And then the background field goes away. And, and here's an area. These are called swirls. And they're okay. this is really it huge. Is I mean, these are, you know, the, the, the central feature off to the left, that's probably, you know, 150 kilometers in size. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have what looks like uh, a, a snaky uh, feature off to the right. That's also trapped magnetic field material. And, and we now know, based on our knowledge of our Earth's magnetosphere, how the magnetic field of our Earth has protected us over time. And so we want to be able to drive into these areas. We want to be able to see how, the, how that magnetic field interacts with the solar wind, what happens when coronal mass ejections hammer the moon and, and mm -hmm. hits a swirl like that, huh. and how we could be protected because of that field. Now, that field has to be intense. To, yeah. For us to be able to make a measurement of that's it, right. so we can measure it from orbit. Well, geez, that's fantastic. So uh, as you can see, that that the discoloration on the surface, uh, as you see the light and dark areas, this whole area is just flat, and the difference is how the regolith is organized, or or how it has been exposed to the solar wind and changes in it over time yeah. and so that all that stuff is really fascinating you know it it enables yeah. us to look at how the solar wind has impinged itself in the moon mm -hmm. and locked into the moon in certain regions but has not done so in these swirls that's why they're all white yeah. but that whole area is just flat as a pancake it's good it, you say that because i thought it was ridges right yeah. you yeah, think it's ridges yeah, but right. it's it not that way it's just yeah. a discoloration of the surface huh. And, and there's a lot of disagreement now on some pretty yeah. fundamental aspects of it. You know, what is, what are the details of the magnetic field? The material that you see that's light, is that fresh material? Some people think it is. Mm -hmm. um, one of the foremost scientists uh, that works with our institute, actually, Carly Peters at uh, Brown University today, said she doesn't think so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and quite honestly, I love it when science is like that, when there's yeah. a lot of disagreement, because <laughs> that means that we're going to find new things. Yeah. And that means yeah. that we need to send a mission there to, to uh, find it. Well, and it won't be just any old mission. It's got to be, you know, something that can uh, translate across that and make measurements. Yep. Uh, uh, and so that would be a rover. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, so as the commercial groups are, are planning to land on the moon and look around and have resources, and some will be landers and some will be rovers, you know, we want to be able to say, hey, these are sites that if you, mm. you go there, we want to go with you. We yeah. want to participate in that grand adventure. We want to be able to make measurements that not only are important to them, but are but are revolutionize our science and our understanding of, of this of our closest neighbor, the moon. Yeah. So so to pivot over to the chat, because they were right, it has been blowing up. But we've been <laughs> saving as many questions as we possibly can. Right. Though a, a, a while back we had uh, V1K 
1337 said, if you read this message out loud, I will be so happy. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> and then not only that, Jim, you're getting some love from S4D. This is like Panda Ah. says, I love Jim, man. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. Well, that's <laughs> great. Thank you very much. But I want to go to Luchador90, who is asking, would the moon be a good place for a telescope since there's no atmospheric oh, distortion? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I, so uh, one, uh, one of our investigators, one of our scientists at, at my institute, um, as Jack Burns at University of Colorado, he wants to do just that. And, but, the, but the kind of telescope that he wants to put up there is a little bit uh, different than what uh, most people might be uh, thinking of. He wants to put uh, a series of dipole radio antennas. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you might think, well, why the heck do you want to do that? Why don't you just do that here? Mm -hmm. the, the problem is, is, is we all have our devices and uh, all yeah. sorts phones. of yeah. phones, you know, you name it, that are completely contaminating the uh, electromagnetic spectrum in the, in the radio region. You know, and so, and it turns out that the far side of the moon, since uh, since it's always uh, it's always opposed to uh, Earth, is uh, one of the radio one of the most radio quiet areas in the solar system, huh. the mo the quietest in the inner solar system. Wow. And so, and so, and the thing is, okay, then then you think, well, why? You know, what's so interesting about this frequency range? As it turns out, um, you can hear echoes of the formation of the first stars mm -hmm. by putting telescopes. This is what we think. We've never done it before, but, uh, but it's quiet enough that we, can, uh, we think we're going to be able to observe that. And this is, uh, this is what Jack and what we want to enable. So, you know, was, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 well, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Scientists, you know, look at various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And from that, we, we make all kinds of new and neat discoveries and, and look, at, look at the universe in new ways. And our atmospheres prevented us from doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And that's why our spacecraft are so valuable. That puts our eyes above the, the, the atmosphere, which then prevents these wavelengths from making it to the ground. In the radio area, uh, is just like any other part of the electromagnetic spectrum. If there's a region we haven't been able to look at and explore, that's the new frontier. Nice. Yep. Well. And in the 20 megahertz to yep. a couple hundred megahertz range, yeah. uh, uh, even though those radio waves do make it down to the ground because of the radio interference that we have today, we have to go some, someplace else. And yeah. the far side of the moon is a is a great opportunity to be able to put something there and, and explore a brand new region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we had a question a while back, and then somebody, this is VT Whiplash asked, how bad is the latency from the moon to the Earth? But then there was another question that scrolled through too quickly. I did not see the name on it. But they were like, if you did a Twitch stream from the moon to the Earth, how bad would that latency be? So, so round trip time is about three seconds or so. Okay, okay. it's not yeah. that bad. Yeah. It could be so, worse. So when President Nixon talked with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, that's uh, when he said hello, it took a uh, you know, second and a half or thereabouts, a little bit less, to get there. Then even if they responded right away, right back, it would take another second and a half to get back. And mm -hmm. so round trip, it's uh, mm -hmm. at three seconds. Yeah. Okay. So a, a Twitch stream from the moon <laughs> sounds entirely doable. Yeah, yeah. But. So, so, but uh, controlling a robot or something like mm -hmm. that, maybe not so much. Yeah, is that a big challenge? Yeah, it, it is a big challenge. Oh. We, we actually, at my institute, in a, a few years back, we had uh, hosted a centennial challenge where mm -hmm. uh, it was called the Lunar Regolith Excavation Challenge. And we got eight tons of regolith stimulant we call in in a uh, in what we fondly call the dirt box <laughs> nice. and, and uh, various teams most of them college teams got to make robots oh, and cool. uh, they couldn't be the operators couldn't be right there with the, with the robots they had to be in another room and what they did is they actually put that same latency in that yeah. three second round trip be realistic. latency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And so they had to develop systems that would uh, that would take care of that. But uh, you know what? They they figured it out. In fact, they're still using that bed. And so that's a that's a shout out for people who, if they go to like facebook.com slash you know, NASA yeah. Ames. We did a Facebook Live a while mm -hmm. back where they're using this now for experiments of like the light of how like the whites are super 
bright and the darks are super dark and how that means for autonomy and, and rovers. Yeah. And, and yeah. so if anybody wants to go dig through, well, that was like a couple yeah. months ago. Um, yeah, people can go through and get a first hand, or like, well, second hand. They can see people talking about it. No, that was awesome. That was well, a really it was. You know, story. we were interested in that because the lighting is is like polar lighting, yeah. and, and the poles are super interesting in terms of the moon. That's one of the places we really want to go because of the resources that are there. You know, we talked about water a little mm -hmm. bit earlier. It's not you're not going to find it on the equator where every day it would just evaporate. There are yeah. these regions called permanently shadowed regions mm -hmm. on, on the moon that haven't seen sunlight for a billion years. Oh. And uh, and so now how water got there, you know, there's a lot of debate about that. There's probably yeah. multiple processes, perhaps comets um, landing, things like that. But uh, nonetheless, um, we- well, Of course they didn't go like this. They really impacted- That's right, that's right. <laughs> it wasn't Busted a part. That's a good point, Jim. And, it wasn't and, a soft and, and that, landing. Yeah, it wasn't a yeah, soft yeah, landing. Yeah. And then that <laughs> material, if it wasn't in the polar in the beginning, it actually migrates. That's that's because right. it's a cold area, very cold area. It's called yeah. a cold trap. Yeah. And and so indeed, um, uh, that uh, uh, sort of attracts that stuff. It does. What is yeah. it that after migrates? the impact. It does. What migrates? The water. The water. Does? Water. Yeah. The water yeah. will yeah. migrate. Uh -huh. huh. That's right. It, it evaporates, and uh, you know, and then it, and then it, and then it goes down when it's cold. And so, and oh, once right. it goes down in one of these permanently shadowed regions, that's where it stays yeah, for a billion years. Yeah, right. yeah. That's incredible. And, and yeah. so, well, we we showed up on on the screen. Um, what Brian is working on. We can go to the cloud cam. And so, folks, I, I can introduce uh, Brian Day, the guy. Oh, we'll go to the cloud cam, the other one. Here that we go. One, no. Oh, 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 no, oh, not oh. that one. <laughs> there he is. Hey, the, the best beard in Silicon Valley. Um, so, and, and for folks, if you want more on Brian Day, we had a podcast that we did with him a couple months back, and so you can look at that. Yeah. But he's been working, uh, showing a program called Moon Trek. You can literally type into Google or your, the search engine of your choice um, moon trek <laughs> nasa and you'll find exactly what brian's looking at but great yeah, you just want to talk yeah. a little bit about what moon trek is how that came about and then you want to show us some stuff uh, some of the landing sites sure yeah. sure I, yeah. I, I, uh, indeed um, many years ago as uh, we were contemplating uh leaving low earth orbit moving out in the solar system and the moon was a, a potential target of course and and we're still hanging on to that idea as uh, as we move out um we realized that our data sets, and we've been uh, launching spacecraft and orbiting the moon and, and, and uh, 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 even some of the old um, uh, lo lunar mapping missions that the Apollo uh, era used, that data is becoming now more available to us because we're digitizing it and putting it into uh, these kind of frameworks. Um, we decided we needed to be able to bring this data together, co-register co it, you know, such that it's all uh, connected to the right coordinate system, and then allow us to peer at the moon in different wavelengths and in different temperatures uh, and really in different altitudes. You can see the variation in heights, and that tells us all kinds of things about the structures a little bit about how they are put together and what they're made of, and then, of course, um, uh, looking for safe landing uh, spots. So um, uh, that particular system uh, we've, uh, we've been working on for quite a few years, and we made the decision early on that we were going to make it uh, network accessible so that uh, not only can any, any scientist get access to it or, or any, any of the other space agencies that are looking mm -hmm. for how to use mm -hmm. LRO data to be able to land, but also everybody in the public can take a look at it. Even video yeah. game companies yeah, right. can yeah, grab absolutely. this and use well, real and, data. And awesome. anyone who's watching this right now, yeah. actually, yeah. We could just go bring it up and look at it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, we did awesome. see uh, that FlyStop was uh, uh, a, uh, a fabulous cratered system uh, in the southern hemisphere, and you can tell by now. We're, now, now this is a different view, but. Oh, so oh, oh, let's go, let's go to, let's go to, uh, 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 we can go to Schrodinger, or you can go to um, uh, Schrodinger or Tycho, maybe. Uh, well, Tycho's a little uh, not not quite in the polar region, but no, no, uh, uh, no, of course oh, not. Oh, you want to? <laughs> of course not. Who wants to go to Tycho? Oh, uh, well, Ty, Ty, Tycho, you Gosh. know. Gosh, you know, we we as a, you I'm know like we need a, peak. This is Tycho Tycho Brahe, so we. It's a shout out to. 
to what what he has so, done, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for us as we talked a little bit about. Right, so Brian about will give us book. a shout out when he's ready to go. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 those regions are just uh, really exciting. Wow, but they're challenging. Not mm-hmm. only on the uh, they are on the moon, yes. but you know, it's dark there, and so if we've got a spacecraft that moves in there that wants to make measurements, we're going to have to either bring our own light or it's going to have to you know feel its way along. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. And that's and having mechanical components work in the cold like that is not so easy too, because right. mm-hmm. we're talking really really cold here. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's a, as I said, that becomes a cold trap. It's uh, the temperature is very low because it does, doesn't get heated. Uh, yeah. Because of the sun angle, as such, uh, and so consequently, uh, you know that we, we expect accumulation of ices. Now, mm-hmm. if it's cometary material, it's more than just water. You know, it's ammonia, yeah. and and and, yeah. and other kinds of um, uh, ices, and uh, you know, methane, and things that uh, were probably the, in the original collapsing cloud that form the comets. Uh And so if we want to look at pristine material Mm -hmm. that's four and a half billion years, this actually might be the place to go. Hmm. So while Brian's pulling that up, we'll we'll grab uh, on the chat. We have no way get real. Uh, (laughs) I got to love the the Twitch handles. It's pretty awesome. Um, Are there different types of weather on the moon? I'm guessing the I'm, I'm thinking the answer is uh, just straight up no, but I think there's probably something more interesting than that. <laughs> yes, there is. All right, All right. let's do it. So uh, it's it's not like the weather you're used to, but because it doesn't have like the atmosphere we know and love, it actually is exposed to the solar wind mm-hmm. two thirds of the time, mm-hmm. and the other third of the time it's exposed to interactions between the Earth in its magnetosphere and the mm-hmm. solar wind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In other words, the moon crosses the Earth's magneto tail. Now, when that happens, it's a, it's, it, it is indeed a different environment. But when it's outside the Earth's magneto, magneto tail and in, in the solar wind, then it gets hammered with the normal things that come from the sun. The, the sun constantly outgasses. You know, it's just like it exhales everywhere and we call that the solar wind and it loses matter when it does that and and that material moves out so there's a constant stream of that Mm -hmm. and then sometimes things happen with the sun's magnetic field that envelopes a whole section of it energizes it and throws it out and we call that a coronal mass ejection and that can hammer the moon just as well as it hammers uh, hammers the earth and when it hammers the earth and he interacts with our own magnetic field, it produces aurora, okay? Uh-huh. When it hammers the moon, yeah. that solar wind gets embedded right into the soils uh-huh. and changes, changes its composition, changes its mineralogy. Uh-huh. It makes it a different set of material. Um, and we can, and, and, and you know, in the swirls, these areas that, that uh, have the remnant magnetic field actually probably protects the surface of the sun from that. And that's another reason why we want to go there. We want to see what the pristine early solar uh, regular, the, the, the soils on the, on the moon look like uh, by going in those areas. There's so much going on on the moon. There's ah, a lot so going we got, on. We, it's a cool. Schrodinger. Ah, right, yeah. Yeah. Schrodinger, Schrodinger has arrived. <laughs> All right. Well, there it is on the on our screen. Uh, yep. Yep. All right. Yeah, here we oh, go. Yeah, okay. Amazing. All right. Go on. Tell us. <laughs> oh, well, you know. Pray tell. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is just an absolutely spectacular uh, crater. You actually can see s- uh, uh, several features about it that, that you have to think about. You see normal smaller craters, you know, where there's an impact but no central peak. Those typically are, are uh, maybe 5, 10 kilometers in size. And then there are, you know, if you look real hard, you might see a crater that's bigger that actually has a central peak. And then a new, the new idea here is this crater is so enormous that it actually has two rims. Mm. Uh, and, and so this is a tremendous impact. Uh, Clive, correct me if I'm not right, this actually is one of the younger impacts at this size. It's, it's, uh, it's actually one of the older ones. All right, older it ones, older thank ones. you. Yeah, it's one of the older yeah. ones. Yeah. And so we yeah. want to get in it and we want to age, bring back material and age date it. And um, 
uh, really understand uh, uh, how old these structures are. Uh, we also want to go to some of the newer craters and younger craters and examine those. You can also see on the surface these, the, the, these, uh, these features uh, where there are gullies or thin, they look like gullies. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're, uh, this, mm -hmm. this crater is actually filled in with basaltic material. That means, that means that once you hit it, the molten rock underneath inside mm -hmm. the moon bubbled up and then started to fill in the crater. Mm -hmm. Like oh, wow. lava. That's right. And that's like different lava. than the, that, yeah, yeah uh -huh. like lava. Yeah. And this is a different, different feature. If it was hit on the on the on the far side of the moon, we don't see a lot of these uh, huge regions that are uh, that are old lava fields. And that's because the 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 the, the um, we believe uh, the um, uh, tidally locking part mm -hmm. of the moon, where we only have one face, actually pulls gravitationally the moon to the point where magma is much more likely to flow on the near side than it is the far side. Yeah. And so a lot of the craters That's on the far side different. don't have floors of magma that have come mm. up. Yeah. So here, here's a question that came real quick from A Shrubbery 2. Is there any potential for life to exist anywhere on the moon? I know it couldn't live on the surface, but is it possible that it could be buried underground or in polar ice? We're in the caves. There's in life the caves. in caves all over the place. <laughs> we have all kinds now, of extreme I'm not, environments. I'm not, I'm not starting speculation in that area. Yeah, but yeah. so probably not. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably the, not. The problem, Sorry, guys. The problem is, uh, you know, how would it have evolved? You know, on, on Earth, a long time ago, there were some uh, very favorable conditions for that, right? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we had we had an atmosphere, um, we had uh, liquid water, we had all of the organic ingredients, we had everything. This kind of pea soup, you know, that uh, that could result in uh, in in life. Now, um, are there places that could result in in life? Uh, you know that that are completely different. You know, some have speculated mm -hmm. that maybe life could exist in the uh, in the lakes of Titan, for instance. I, I'm not one of those believers myself necessarily, but uh, but it's but I suppose it's possible. Yeah, but, there's better places in the solar system. There than yes, are. there's more but, interesting places. You know, when the moon formed early, it it also had a lot of organic material it had to on its surface, and that organic material was also brought to it by other impacts. What it what the detractor for the moon is that it's it's so sm it's small in comparison to the Earth. Therefore, its gravity isn't very big, mm -hmm. and therefore it didn't hang on to that. And then the sun just ate that away. You know, with with the energy Radiation. of the sun breaking up the organic material and the solar wind, then stripping that away. Yeah. Uh, and so that so that really made it that really makes it tough. That's, uh, that's that's why the, the polar regions with the polar ices, they may contain the building blocks yeah. for life. And yeah. I'm going to say, Eric, Eric, can you hear Clive on there? Or do we need him to move closer to the mic? I can hear him, actually. Oh, yeah, awesome. Excellent. Good. Excellent. I, didn't, I didn't want our poor audio listeners to be like, I can't hear Clive. <laughs> no, you're good, man. Go for it. But they, 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 those ices may contain the materials that came to Earth, but they've not evolved because it's too cold. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that material may be what led to, to what you see on the screen right now, which is scary. But then, uh, <laughs> right now, right now. That one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's not on Clive. the screen right not, now. Not so. him, but, but, uh, yes. <laughs> but, that, but that, that's why we want to go there in terms of science, to see, okay, are there the pre pre-biology molecules now, there? What did we start out with? That, right. uh, what what right. did we start as? What, yeah, was the, right. what were the starting blocks? Right. What's the moon important? But then those same molecules can be used to support life up there now. You can get water, you can crack the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. You can breathe the oxygen, you can put the hydrogen back into the process, get more water, you can drink it, you can crack it again, use hydrogen and oxygen as rocket fuel. So yeah. there's there's a way that the moon becomes very important as a, as a refueling depot uh, for mm -hmm. exploration, but mm -hmm. very important for understanding why we're here and, and how mm -hmm. things started. Well, we're, a lot oh, of people cool. are That's interested in these uh, questions. We have laboratories here at NASA Ames where where we we are using very very cold temperatures with uh, with some very raw um, you know pre organic material exposing it to ultraviolet light just like it would be exposed to in in uh, in deep space and seeing what happens and and there have been people. Uh, here, such as Lou Alamandola and others that have been doing this for years and have found that uh, 
some pretty complicated uh, um, things called uh, um, PAHs um, uh, and other compounds form in a deep space environment. And so, uh, and so the question of how life originates and, uh, and exactly where it originates is by no means settled. It's still an act, active uh, debate topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are the building blocks of life, right? The building because blocks. Whenever that's we talk right. about organics, I'm afraid people might understand like live organic material, but you're talking about molecules that can that's right. come together. And yeah, organics in a scientist's uh, point of view yeah. is a, are, are uh, molecules that are made from carbon, mm -hmm. basically, you know, carbon and other uh, atoms. But yeah, that's right. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. cool. So I'm going to try to get to some more questions. This is from a while back. Isutino749, what are the plans for this year's missions? Okay. So How about the guy who holds all the money? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing with it. <laughs> Go for it. No, no, that'd be the worst thing to do. <laughs> he gives it away. I, give, yeah, I, get, yeah. I get it out. Yeah, 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 I get it out. I get it out. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so uh, we have just an absolutely spectacular planetary program. It's, it, you know, it's... Uh, unbelievable the kind of things that we're doing you know right now we've got uh, uh, LRO as I mentioned orbiting uh, the moon making spectacular observations we move a little further out into the solar system you go to places like Mars we have a set of spacecraft that are orbiting uh, Mars right now one uh, the Mars reconnaissance orbiter also could see a table about this size <laughs> if it sat on the surface of Mars so so we have some similar things going at the moon as we do Mars and then of course on Mars uh, we have uh, uh, two active rovers uh, one's called Opportunity and the other is called Curiosity Curiosity is making its way up Mount Sharp and right now it's at a layer where there were clays, okay? Now clays um, uh, were formed in water. Uh, so now we know that whole area was just filled with water for a, a fair length of time. And clays might be the perfect place for organic molecules to connect and, and start building uh, structures that could uh, uh, be of uh, importance to life. So that's an important uh, set of observations. We're gonna be starting to make those. As we move further out into the asteroid belt, we have a spectacular mission. Uh, it's called Dawn, mm -hmm. and Dawn is uh, now orbiting Ceres. This year, we're going to change its orbit. It's going to be a highly elliptical orbit. It's going to get really close to the surface and make high-resolution imaging of, of certain regions so that uh, we get a better idea as to what Ceres is like, particularly in the future if we want to be able to land and study that. Also, uh, an asteroid mission called Osiris Rex. Nice. This time, uh, let's see, uh, we are v getting very close to a, an asteroid called Bennu. And Bennu is a carbonaceous chondrite. It's, it's a kind of a, uh, a ball shaped, you know, it has a, it has a fat little belly or a equatorial it, band it, it, associated with carbonation, it. Carbonaceous chondrite. <laughs> yes. I was waiting. Go yes. on. Yes. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's go for so, that. So, so, uh, it's full of carbon. Yeah. That's what I was and, thinking. And it's just, you know, a nation to its own. So it's carbonaceous. <laughs> and, um, uh, what that's all about is, is, uh, it, it, because it's so rich in carbon, we think it has amino acids. We believe it has a fair amount of water. It had the early, early collapsing cloud material that, that uh, things like it bombarded the Earth and brought those things to our planet that, that we believe potentially started and helped start life on it. And by going to uh, Bennu, this, uh, this primitive asteroid, we're going back in time and we're going to really examine it in a way that that uh, we've never done before. That's gonna that's gonna get to Bennu starting in August. Mm -hmm. So in the next several months, Bennu is gonna get closer and closer mm -hmm. uh, in view to us as Osiris Rex comes up to it, and 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 it's just gonna be a spectacular set of observations. We're we're just really waiting for that. So then as we go further out in the solar system, you know we. We, we um, ran out of fuel on Cassini, or you know, it was down to the final few breaths, and we did ditch it uh, into Saturn uh, this last year in a spectacular event. We didn't want it uh, uh, flying into any of the really fabulous mm -hmm. bodies like, like Titan we talked yeah. a little bit about, or Enceladus. Yeah. 
Um, uh, and so uh, we have nothing at Saturn at the moment. But then as we move much further out, we have a spacecraft racing its way out of the solar system called New Horizons. It did a fabulous yeah. flyby of Pluto yeah. a couple of years ago. And in January 1st of next year, 2019, it's going to fly by a smaller uh, object in uh, beyond Pluto. It's called a Kuiper Belt object. This is also debris left over from the collapsing cloud that we've just now discovered. So in our lifetime, we actually found these pieces out there, and there, there's probably you know tens of thousands of them out there. These are building blocks of, of objects that become Pluto, Pluto-like objects, and there's quite a few of those bigger objects like that out there. And, and so uh, we're, we're really excited about that fl flying by. In fact, we, we now know that it may not be just one object, it might be as many as three. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Yeah. and so it's going to be really exciting as we as we fly by it. So we have quite a few things going going on this year, and then in May in particular, the start of a new mission. I talked mm -hmm. about those missions that are active right now. Our next start of a mission is on May fifth, with the launch of Insight, mm -hmm. and Insight is going to Mars. It's a unique platform that allows us to put down on the surface several important types of measurements, one of which is a, a seismic system that will then really get, um, uh, uh, give us knowledge about how, how Mars quakes, mm -hmm. and we know it quakes. We wow. see avalanches from space really? from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbit. Yeah, we oh, caught them yeah, in progress. Yeah. You know, the sides of the mountain coming down. Wow. <laughs> oh my God, wow. You know, something, something's happening. Something's shaking there. And, and, and Mars gets hit, too, gets hit by asteroids. That causes quakes, too. So the seismic measurements will tell us about the structure of Mars. And we want to do that at the moon. Yeah. We, we, we want to be able to think about how we can land things on the moon to make those kind of measurements. Mm. And then that helps us understand the structure of these terrestrial bodies. We know the structure of Earth well because we have seismic in, uh, measurements here now uh, and have for decades. Uh, and we're starting that on Mars and we want to start that on, on the moon too. So insight. Cinco de Mayo, uh, nice. May, May the 5th, it's, it's, it's going up. And it lands in Mars also this year in November. Well, and then we've been to uh, places like Mercury. Yes. A little bit longer ago, Venus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, uh, in the United States, has been first to every one of the planets and even Pluto, you know? <laughs> and, um, USA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the chat. It's going, I have so many questions. There's no way we're going to get to it. We're going to wrap up in a couple of minutes. I was going to try to do it at three o'clock. But do you want to do a rapid fire on a couple of these sure. short, pithy things? Try to get as many people sure. involved as possible. Yeah, nice. absolutely. Yeah. All right, so let's go with Navi XP. How long until we could put humans on Mars? What are some of the hurdles to building a colony there? Oh, okay, wow. so short and pithy. So, in my, in my opinion, um, it, it's going to happen, and, and and it's not real. There's there's uh, some technology things we're working on. We know what what we have to do and how we have to do it, and so I don't think there's any showstoppers. It's really all about will. Mm -hmm. It's really all about um, the American people deciding uh, that we want to move in this direction. Uh, we're working hard with our international partners, and we know it's going to be an international uh, activity. And, and as we do that, uh, I think that will hasten the opportunity. I would like to see that happen, uh, having humans on Mars uh, in my lifetime. Uh, it's uh, certainly, certainly uh, viable. Let's go to Dazzle Dorn. Um, astronauts returning from the moon to Earth went through decontamination to make sure they didn't bring back organisms. Did they do the same procedures before going to the moon to, the moon mm. to avoid contaminating it? No, no, not that I'm not. They that took I'm aware every of. organism they could get. With. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's pretty much impossible to do that. Wow. You, you know, the thing is, yeah. is, is we are ecosystems. You know, we mm -hmm. we have yeah. um, more more mass of other stuff with us than we do human mass. 
and and uh, we have a tremendous variety of organisms on us. Mm -hmm. We're we're actually really just learning about things like the gut biome right. and how yeah. much we it, need that. We do, yeah. we do. It's it, it. it's incredibly important, you know. And so uh, we will no, we will never be able to sterilize ourselves. The, the, the later Apollo missions did not go. The astronauts didn't go through that contamination because they knew there was they weren't bringing uh, anything. Back. Right. That's right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, Sorith Avra, would water from moon be drinkable? Yeah, H2O is H2O. Nice. Now, uh, but I would say this, we would anticipate that, that what we would get when we, when we go to a permanently shattered region and grab that material is a variety of things, a mixture of things. It wouldn't necessarily just only be H2O. Right. You know, it would be other volatiles in it. You know, as we mentioned, it could be... Um, a methane uh, uh, could even be, you know, perhaps some ammonia in it. That's those are the kind of things that we see in comets too. So, all right, we'll grab one more before we wrap it up. This is uh, Preto underscore Nahuel. So I'm totally butchering this. <laughs> um, can we eventually, and they put it in all caps because they really mean it. Um, can we eventually terraform the moon? The moon. Wow. Wow. That's know. A, you know, I know people have looked. <laughs> People have looked at terraforming Mars for a long time. Chris McKay, one of the experts on mm -hmm. that, is right here at, at NASA, at NASA Ames. The moon, I'm not sure if the gravitational field is strong enough, quite honestly. What, what you need to do to be able to terraform an object is have, uh, have a planet or a moon with enough gravity to hold in atmosphere. You know, and mm -hmm. and then and then be able to be able to eventually have liquid water exist, and below a certain pressure, that's not that's not going to happen. And so, um, could you do it by impacting enough comets? I I don't know. Someone's probably done the calculations. I don't know what it, what they mm -hmm. are. Cool. Well, so um, as we get ready to wrap up, a couple of plugs. We have Gravity Assist. Um, this is I have to give the shout out. It was Sarah Noble who you had on yes. the moon episode, which is already up yes. online. People can go ahead and mm -hmm. listen to that. Right. Right. You, which one yeah. do you have so, coming up? Is it going out so, today? Uh, this, no, this, uh, every Wednesday we put out one, and uh, I think this week uh, we did uh, Linda Spilker mm -hmm. uh, on Saturn. Uh, so that's been posted. we got a couple more to go uh, in this season. Uh, after that, I'm going to talk to Amy Simon. Nice. Uh, who's uh, fa oh I know I have, I know, I have, I know I have who a they cheat are. sheet over here are. and he's like I got yeah, it yeah 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 and uh, she's going to talk about Uranus and Neptune you know those are uh, those are really huge planets and and you know uh, we think of them as gas planets gas giants but they're very different than Saturn and and Jupiter so um, uh, that's uh, that's been really intriguing and and uh, she's been studying those her whole scientific career and then we'll end with uh, uh, this season with Alan Stern we're going to talk about uh, mm -hmm. uh, Pluto uh, which is uh, probably one of the most uh, exciting places in the solar system I, I think I think when we flew by it I I, I, I uh, just yeah. was absolutely shocked what a surprise oh for yeah everyone. oh man yeah <laughs> I mean that that body is uh, you know much smaller than the moon yeah but it has an atmosphere. Now, we just oh, got yeah. done talking about no atmosphere on the moon, nor yeah. will it ever have it. <laughs> yeah. And Pluto's got it. Yeah. You know, and how'd that happen? it's geologically active, and too. it's geologically active. <laughs> no it's one got, expected that. You know, it's got that. these nitrogen, uh, you know, uh, uh, glaciers that, you know, move like toothpaste, scouring the surface mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and creating this beautiful heart-looking region. And, and it, just, it just blew my mind. Excellent. Well, so um, as I was saying, like, well, I always talk about, like, you know, when we talk about gravity assist, yeah. it's like, um, this is the NASA in Silicon Valley podcast. Well, technically, this is NASA in Silicon Valley live, but we're a podcast. We're not the only NASA podcast. Gravity Assist, Houston, we have a podcast, is one that's out of uh, Johnson Space Center that we work a lot with them. Um, there's uh, a YouTube and audio version of This Week at NASA that mm -hmm. they're still going. It's shorter, like four or five minute mm -hmm. little segments. So a lot of content out there for people to grab. Um, you know, this has been the NASA and Silicon Valley podcast. Huge mm -hmm. thanks to Jim Green my and to pleasure. Greg Schmidt for yeah, joining us. Um, Thank you. And I'd yeah. be remiss to, we have Eric is in our audio studio. We have him on the, the, the voice of God. 
god, you know, <laughs> over there. And if we go to the cloud, the cloud cam, over on the far left, we have Jesse and Dave. Uh, you can't Clive. see Dominique is <laughs> sitting over there. Oh, yeah, right. uh, Clive and Brian sitting there. So huge thanks, guys. This has been way fun. Um, for folks who are listening or watching on demand, or if you're listening to this on your audio, like, too bad you can't see everybody wave, but trust us that, that they are. Um, <laughs> we'll, well, if you're watching on demand, we're on all the major social media platforms under NASA Ames. We are using the hashtag NASA in Silicon Valley, and we've gone analog, so uh, we have a phone number. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, you can also call uh, 650-604-1400. Call, we're not gonna answer the phone, <laughs> but leave a comment or a question, and then we'll try to figure out how we can wrap that into an episode. Um, if you, uh, you know, huge thanks to everybody who participated live and participated in the chat. We're going to keep doing this, um, not next Friday, but the Friday after that. We're working on a fun show where we're talking some the early days of VR development, okay. oh, cool. also autonomous uh, vehicles, systems, stuff uh -huh. like that. Uh, we're, we're trying to solidify that up. So not next Friday, but the Friday after that. Um, if you haven't already, go ahead. Click like, share, subscribe, every button on the screen or podcast app that you can think of. Um, that's uh, how you can find us. Uh, you know, and that is all of my plugs that I'm doing. But I also yeah. do need to give a shout out to the at NASA Moon. Um, you know, they there's a lot of moon activity happening at NASA. We had the, the super moon, there's the blood moon, the, the eclipse right, earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we also, uh, you know, in October, I think it's October 20th, uh, uh, really promote uh, the International Observe the Moon Night. Nice. You know, where, where, we, where we get a lot of people out, we have opportunities to talk about the moon as we see it from Earth, but but interact with a lot of subject matter experts, a lot of scientists that, that go to uh, various places and uh, where where many people are congregating to look at the moon and and really yeah. give you some great details about what's going I, on. I think the bottom line is this is your space agency, so exactly. get involved. <laughs> you know, we want you. <laughs> And, and the moon we have is not old, not any old moon. As uh, it's, it's, it's our it's our, our moon. moon. <laughs> well, and, and this is all, another thing. This is we're doing this on Twitch. We're doing this as a podcast. Notice there are no ads. There's no you don't don't give us any tips. Um, <laughs> pay your taxes, and this is how we survive. Yeah. So fortunately, we, we don't have to throw in ads or baked in anything. So. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you for making this thank possible. You. Thank yeah. you guys for watching, and we will see you in a couple weeks. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, <laughs>